So welcome to the second Sunday after Pentecost on June 6th, 2021. Uh, to begin, I'd like to uh, wish a happy birthday to, to uh, Diane and Rick Saunders' granddaughter, Evely Grace Burton, on June 7th, Glenn York on June 8th, and uh, Eric Tribe on June 9th. I wish you all the blessings and strength and, and health these days, and may you be able to celebrate many more birthdays to come. Grandmothers to grandmothers, gift cards are, are due today. So if you are interested in supporting Stephen Lewis Foundation through gift cards, please uh, email your request uh, to Bala. Uh, next Sunday, we have a very special guest speaker, Carrie Crow, whom I've known for maybe 30 years now. And uh, we, we will hear from her after the service as an introduction. And uh, in light of the 215 children's bodies discovered in the former residential school in Kamloops, BC, and June 21st being the National Indigenous Peoples Day, there will be a showing of the documentary movie, Finding Peter Bryce. On, uh, on the June 17th, Thursday at 7.30, uh, the length of the movie is 22 minutes and there will be a uh, discussion following the movie. And uh, Dr. Peter Bryce was Ontario's first chief of public health and his innovations were copied across North America. In the early 20th century, as the medical officer with oversight and responsibilities for Canada's residential school, uh, Dr. Bryce identified the shortcomings of the system's response to malnutrition and TB. And uh, his report on the epidemics and recommendations uh, were, were basically cast aside and uh, he was fired uh, for discovering the truth. And uh, in 1922, Peter Bryce published a story called Story of a National Crime. And uh, anyways, the, uh, the documentary movie uh, was made by his great grandson about discovering his, his uh, great grandfather's uh, uh, role and what he did and uh, very, very uh, interesting. And uh, one more uh, thing that I'm, I guess, offering is a, a course on how to host a Zoom meeting. And uh, this will be relevant to all the committee chairs who will need to uh, host a meeting once I'm gone and uh, it can be more independent. And uh, this course will be held on Thursday, June 24th at 7.30 p.m. and uh, the information uh, uh, is on uh, Doug's e-news as well. And uh, late last night, uh, we got a uh, email from Peter Toison, uh, whose daughter Veronica uh, has been ill and we've been uh, praying for her for many years. And this is the uh, letter that uh, Peter sent. Dearest Pastor Doug and the prayer group, I am very happy to tell you that Veronica had a very successful kidney transplant this evening. And according to her surgeon at Toronto General Hospital, she also received a very good kidney from her donor. Although we may never know who the donor is, I am sure that person who has given Veronica a new life will be in heaven for the good and kind deeds he or she has done. From my family, we thank you all so very much for the constant prayers and well wishes you gave us. You held our hands when the road to recovery was so very difficult. You gave us hope when there was no light at the end of the tunnel. Especially you, Doug, you have done so much to bring us to this point. We can now rejoice in the name of Jesus please be ready for our invitation to celebrate God's victory. Always with my deepest regards, 
Peter was on. So what a wonderful news and, uh, and uh, we rejoice in this day. Let us now prepare our hearts and minds and our bodies for worship. Let us begin this service with acknowledgement of land. We acknowledge this land on which Ebenezer United Church serve our community. For thousands of years, this land has been on the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to worship, pray, and practice our faith on this land. Please join John and I as we lead the call to worship. Come into this electronically connected space from couch or office, <clears throat> from comfy recliners or favorite rocking chairs, from kitchens or bedrooms, the risen Christ welcomes us all. We come as we are, unshaven or well coiffed, dressed up or in jammies, eating brunch or brushing teeth. Though separated by distance, we come as one. Come to worship across the distance, but united in faith. We come to listen, to sing, to pray, and to rejoice. Come then, as we join in prayer with our loving God. Loving God, as we worship together, may you forge among us deeper re relationships in creative ways. May you journey with us as we learn to connect through technology. May you breathe into our souls the hope of your good news. May you teach us to thrive while staying home. Show us that your might resides in our all. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us open our hearts to God as we hear the words of this opening prayer. Eternal one, we give thanks for past time and for all that others have accomplished in faithfulness to your call. For present time, and all that leads to lives of dignity, meaning, and joy here. For future time, and all that calls us to confess the sins of the past and work for reconciliation. Loving and faithful life giver, help us to sow seeds of joy and meaning and may there be good ground in which your love can grow. Help us to recognize the seeds of goodness others are sowing and to work alongside them as the realm of justice spreads. Help us to be seeds of change and fertile soil for the advent of your spirit, bringing about a world of warm and lasting welcome, shared humanity, sustainable visions of our common life, and solidarity as strong as oak. Amen. Amen. In light of the 215 children's bodies found in the former residential school, Reverend Murray Pruden, National Executive Minister, Indigenous Ministries and Justice of our church has written a prayer for reconciliation. Please listen to this prayer. Creator, we give thanks for this day and each day you grant us life to walk on this great land, our mother. Give us the heart and strength to come together in prayer in this time of mourning, reflection and peace. The news we have heard these last few days is of our relations, our families, the children, who have been physically taken away from us and who have now been found. 
And with this news, we grieve for their memory, for their struggle, for their spirit. We pray for good understanding, guidance, and love for all our families and communities who will need direction and resolution at this time. And we come together in prayer and ask for your light to guide us to be a part of that needed peace, support, and resolve for everyone who is reacting to this great tragedy in our indigenous nations of this great land. Creator, be with us. Allow us to be brave. Allow us to be strong. Allow us to be gentle to one another. Allow us to be humble. But most of all, allow us to be like the Creator's love. Peace be with us. We lift up our prayers to you in love, trust, and truth. Peace be with us all. In Jesus' name, amen. Our first hymn is Come Now, Almighty King. Today's psalm comes to us from Psalm 138, and this is a paraphrase by, by Mr. Taylor. And please join me and uh, Joan as we read this together. This is your home, your turf, your territory. I am so glad to be here that I kiss the earth you walk on. I fling myself into the dust, the floor of your dwelling. I extend my arms to embrace your earth. But you lift me up from my lowly position. You take me up as your guest. You make me one of your family. You even give me your name. You take me under your wing. When I cry out, you cover me. I benefit from your strength. Foxes may lord it over the chicken coop and squirrels over the sparrow's nest, but no creatures challenge the eagle's rule. As the eagle soars above the field mice, so do you, Lord, rise above us mortals. Daily duties keep us scurrying close to the earth. But you watch over us from on high. You can see danger long before it draws near. Troubles grow around us like tall grass. But in the shadow of your outspread pinions, predators scatter like minnows. 
You watch over me because you have a place for me in your plans. And the gospel reading comes to us from Mark chapter 3, verses 20 to 35. So this is a very early part of Mark's gospel. And uh, Jesus is basically starting his ministry. And uh, before this, he performed miracles and uh, he, uh, he uh, healed lots of people. He called his 12 disciples. And this is what happens next. And, uh, and he uh, actually went home uh, after all the busy time. And this is what happens. And the crowd came together again so, so that they could not even eat. When his family heard it, they went out to restrain him, for people were saying, he has gone out of his mind. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, he has Beelzebul, and by the ruler of the demons, he casts out demons. And he called them to him and spoke to them in parables. How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but his end has come. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his property without first tying up the strong man. Then indeed the house can be plundered. Truly, I tell you, people will be forgiven for their sins and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit can never have forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin, for they had said, he has an unclean spirit. Then his mother and his brothers came, and standing outside, they sent to him and called him. A crowd was sitting around him. And they said to him, your mother and your brothers and sisters are outside asking for you. And he replied, who are my mother and my brothers? And looking at those who sat around him, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. Hearing is the good news. Thanks be to God. Have you ever had your credibility challenged? It happens to the best of us. It happens whether we are professors, doctors, and even ministers. When the Scarborough Presbytery did a pulpit exchange for ministers, I went down to a church at the south end of Scarborough to preach. After the service, one elderly woman came up to me and thanked me for the sermon. Then she confessed, when you got up to the pulpit, I was not even sure whether you could speak English properly. I take some comfort in the fact that I am not alone in this struggle. Even Jesus had a credibility problem. In Mark chapter 3, Jesus was on a roll. He healed a man with a withered hand, but on a Sabbath. He then went to the lakeside where a great multitude gathered around him. The people came from all over various regions, Judea, Jerusalem, Edomia, beyond the Jordan, and the region around Tyre and Sidon. There were so many gathered that he went inside a boat just to, to create some space between himself and the crowd. Then he began to heal the people. Mark also reported that whenever the unclean spirits saw him, they fell down before him and shouted, you are the son of God. This means that it happened a multitude, multitude of times. Then he climbed a mountain and up there where the mountain air is cooler and thinner, he officially called the 12 disciples. Then after that, Jesus needed a break. So he did what 
any of us might do. He went home to his family to catch his breath, eat some home cooked meals, and sleep in his own bed. The problem was that the crowd showed up at his home as well. The people would not leave him alone. He could not even eat. This time, however, the problem was even more severe. The family wanted to restrain Jesus because they heard some people who said he has gone out of his mind. His family, his blood, his first love wanted to curtail Jesus' ministry. The family believed that family believed what some people were saying about Jesus and they were embarrassed. They feared what their neighbors thought of him. In other words, Jesus' family threw him under a horse-drawn buggy. When I was in theology school, we were fortunate enough to have a middle-aged woman as a fellow student and who also decided to live amongst us in the student residence. She played a motherly role and all of us appreciated her very much. I remember asking her one time, what brought you the greatest joy in life? And what brought you the greatest pain in your life? She thought about it for a moment and then she replied, family and family. The situation got even worse when these so-called know-it-all scribes from Jerusalem came down to accuse Jesus that he was possessed by Beelzebul, which enabled him to heal the people and cast out the unclean spirits. Beelzebul literally means the Lord of the flies. The accusation was that Satan was in him that gave him the ability. It is astounding the lies people make up in order to condemn others. In the book, People of the Lie, author Scott M. Peck stated that evil and lies go hand in hand. As for Jesus, foxes have holes and birds have the the nests, but poor Jesus, he really did not have any place to rest his head not even in his home. Though Jesus was trying his best to be compassionate, to heal the people who were suffering, though he was trying to preach the good news, he was accused of doing the work of the devil. You can't get any lower than that to discredit without any proof whatsoever. So how does Jesus respond? He skillfully responds with a parable. How can Satan cast Thou Satan, if a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand. But his end has come. So how can Satan cast out Satan? If the answer is no, then there's no case. If the answer is yes, then it will fall. Something against itself cannot stand, whether it is a nation, a house, church, or a premier soccer league. I have an aunt who lives in New Jersey, and she attends a Korean church that was renting from an American Methodist church. Back in the year 2000, when George W. Bush and Al Gore were up for the U.S. presidential election, the church was divided. Half of the church was in favor of Bush, and the other half was in favor of Gore. The church had a serious conflict, and it was getting heated. They also realized that the church was divided, and there was no room for reconciliation. So they decided to disband. But they did a very, very generous thing they decided to give the church to my aunt's church. So they got a free church out of the deal. I say God works in mysterious ways. In in our mainline liberal church, we do not like to mention Satan. 
I have also heard about some other church that speaks of Satan a lot, that everywhere you turn, there was evil. I made a friend of a friend who needed psychological help because he attended a very conservative church and they really overplayed Satan and he saw Satan everywhere and he was traumatized. Anyway, since Jesus mentioned it, we have to acknowledge that there are forces and configurations of power that hurt and dehumanize humanity. There is the power of race, which tells us to believe that one group is superior to another simply because of the skin color or, or cultural heritage. This past week, all of us in Canada were horrified to learn about the 215 children who were buried in the Indian residential school in Kamloops, BC. There is also the power of patriarchy, which tells us that men should dominate women. There is the power of materialism, which seduces us into thinking that having money is the ultimate goal of life and the defining measure of success. There is the power of militarism, that weapons and war bring peace and security, which justifies killing another human being. There is the power of economic growth, which tells us that it is okay to destroy the environment because it creates jobs. There are many powers and principalities in this world, and Jesus stood against them. Jesus then goes on to make some powerful statements. He says, whoever blasphemies against the Holy Spirit can never have forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For Mark, blasphemy against the Holy Spirit consists of calling the work of God's Holy Spirit evil. Then Jesus said, his true family is not of blood, who threw him under a bus, but whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. Ultimately, those who are committed to doing the work of God, to live according, according to truth, goodness, and justice, bring true spiritual kinship. Jesus suffered a credibility problem from the scribes who thought he had the evil in him while others thought that he was out of his mind. Even his own family was embarrassed for him. Yet he turned that situation to his own advantage as a teaching moment. As for me, I'm a little sad that the presbytery stopped organizing pulpit exchanges. It was fun to exceed the preconceived notion that I could not even speak English properly. In addition, through these exchanges, I met a high school friend in one church and my high school chemistry teacher in another. God works in mysterious ways and we often get surprised. But are you ready and willing to take that risk? Thanks be to God. Let us now join together and sing, Will You Come and Follow Me? Voices United 567.
I was uh, quite uh, surprised and happy to see so many of you who came by church with uh, sandwiches for the out of the cold and also donations to the Juliet's uh, place, uh, women's shelter, or with all the uh, various uh, uh, products. And uh, I'd like to thank you for your gifts of generosity, of your, of your faith, and of your deep devotion to the work of God. And drawing all our gifts and our heart and gratitude, gratitude into one, let us pray the prayer of dedication together. Out of abundance, God, we have been blessed in so many ways. Reveal to us now what it is that we can offer to you in return. Bless what we give of ourselves, not because it is much, but because it is given in earnest. As we recognize our dependence on your grace, remind us that your ways are higher than our own and that you use what we offer to extend that same grace into all the world. Amen. Today, we celebrate the sacrament of that this will be my last communion with you. And uh, it is uh, really uh, kind of sad that uh, we celebrate communion uh, in our own separate homes um, rather than yeah, we can come together as one, sharing common bread and cup. But still, still, the Spirit works through us. However, we are separated. God still comes to us in the simple bread and the juice to remind us that God continues to nourish us, continues to spill us over into our hearts and into our world. And we celebrate Christ's presence with one another this morning. And I also, uh, I guess I wanted the children to uh, to help lead the uh, service as well. And a few children said yes, and I'm very, very happy for that as well. And as we sing, we gather here, Voices 469. If you haven't got your communion elements, please go and get them now as we sing the hymn together.
he joins us here, he breaks the bread, the one who pours the cup is risen from the dead, the one we love the most is now our gracious host, come take the bread, come drink the wine, come share the Lord. We are now a family of which Christ is. Please join John and I as we lead the prayer of great thanksgiving. May God be with us. God is here among us. Let us open our hearts to God. We open them to God and to one another. Let us give thanks to God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Why do we give thanks and praise at this table? We give thanks because God is always with us. We thank you, God, creator of us all. From the beginning, you made the world and all its creatures. You made people to live for you and for one another. We praise you, God. You created Adam and Eve and gave them a garden. You showed Noah a rainbow. You gave Moses strength to free your people and taught Miriam to sing. You gave courage to Esther and loyalty to Ruth. You gave David a harp to sing your praise and helped him defeat the giant. We praise you, O God. Yet even they turned away from you and forgot about you, as we do too. But you did not forget. You sent Jesus to the world to show how much you love us and to bring us back to you again. We praise you, O God. He came as one of us, first an infant, then a child, later a youth, then an adult. He rejoiced with those who rejoiced and wept with those who wept. To the despairing, he spoke a word of hope. To the sick, he gave healing. To the hurting, he was a friend. Still, people turned away from you. They betrayed Jesus and nailed him to a cross. But he was lifted from the grave and restored to life, that he might be with us and we with him alive forevermore. Therefore, with all the saints of every time and place, we join the angels in their praise. Holy, 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 my heart, my heart adores you. My heart is glad to say the words, you are holy God. Why do we eat bread at this table? We gather at this table to remember that on the night before he died, Jesus ate with his friends. He took a loaf of bread and after blessing it, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Each time you do this, remember me. Why do we drink from the, the cup at this table? <clears throat> that same night, Jesus also took a cup and after giving thanks, passed it to his friends, saying, Drink. This cup poured out for you is the promise of God. Whenever you drink it, remember me. What do we remember at this table? We remember Jesus' death and celebrate his resurrection. 
We await with hope his coming again to bring peace and justice to the earth, and we proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Whom do we, for whom do we pray at this table? We pray for God's world, for the poor, the sick, the lonely, people no one cares about. We also pray for the church, the world, for our loved ones, and ourselves. We pray for Roy Dixon, Michelle Gillette, Mavis Grange and her daughter, Dorothy Grant, Joan and Clyde's friends, David and Donna Lee Gullison, Phyllis Harvey, Monique's mother, Iris, Doug's sister, Jackie, Tanya's friends, Kristen, Barbara Nation, Rick Saunders, Diane's friend, Tokiko, Joseph Salins, Joseph Stepaniak, Mary's brother, Basil, Mary's friend, Andrea, Peter Tawasson's daughter, Veronica, and her organ donor, Connie's friend, Elaine Leba, and her daughter, Andrea, Linda Wilson's friend, Linda, and her family, Susan's friends, Joy and Reg, and their daughter, Erin, Heather and Will, Sarah and Demetrios, Sarah's friend, Terence, Sarah's uncle, Dave, Juan's spiritual director, Ignatius, Carrie Krogh's niece, Rebecca, Diane McLean's father, Jack, and all those we name in silence. Send, O God, your Holy Spirit upon us and what we do here, that we and these gifts touched by your Holy Spirit may be signs of life and love to one another <coughs> and to the world. Through Christ, with Christ, and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory is yours, God most holy, now and forever. Amen. Let us now continue to pray as we say the words of this paraphrase of Jesus' prayer. Eternal Spirit, earth maker, pain bearer, life giver, source of all that is and that shall be, father and mother of us all, loving God in whom is heaven, the hallowing of your name echo through the universe, the way of your justice be followed by the peoples of the world. Your heavenly will be done by all created beings. Your commonwealth of peace and freedom sustain our hope and come on earth. With the bread we need for today, feed us. In the hurts we absorb from one another, forgive us. In times of temptation and test, strengthen us. From trials too great to endure, spare us. From the grip of all that is evil, free us. For you reign in the glory of the power that is love, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The body of Christ, broken for you. Amen. The love of Christ, poured out for you. Thanks be to God.
These are the gifts of God for the people of God. All are welcomed at the banqueting table of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, I'd like you to, uh, all of you to turn on your camera so we can see one another as we partake in the Holy Communion. And, uh, and uh, Sean, if you haven't done so already, you know, you've uh, turned off the share screen, that's great. Let us uh, share the communion with one another. after communion prayer life-giving God may we who share Christ's body live his risen life we who drink his cup bring new life to others we whom the spirit lights give light to the world keep us firm in the hope you have set before us so that we and all your children shall be free and all creation will live to praise your name. Amen. Amen. As we depart today, let us live in the world with this prayer in your heart. Please join Joan in saying this prayer by St. Patrick. Christ with me, Christ before me, Christ behind me, Christ in me, Christ beneath me, Christ above me, Christ on my right, Christ on my left, Christ when I lie down, Christ when I sit down, Christ in the heart of everyone who thinks of me, Christ in the mouth of everyone who speaks of me, Christ in the eye that sees me, Christ in the ear that hears me. Arise today through the mighty strength of God. Amen. Amen. Let us go now in peace.
Thank you for joining us uh, this week and uh, shall see you next Sunday.